We just welcome you to Gifts of Spirit Ministry Fellowship today. Praise the Lord, we got some white stuff out there. Some good things. Reminds us that we're washed white as snow. So praise the Lord by the blood of Jesus. The other thing is, as I was praying and preparing, and this was for last week I was preparing for, because I forgot we had Sharon coming. So I said, oh, I didn't have to do it last week, so I'll do it this week. So I didn't have to do much preparation because it was already done. And praise the Lord, the first thing the Lord started speaking to me about, revival is coming, get ready. Amen. Revival is coming, get ready. Yes. What is revival? Revival is a restoration of your heart. Some people think it's a week of meetings. Not so. Unless that week of meaning develops and turns you into a place where your heart turns back to the Lord. Where your heart gets on fire for the Lord. Where things start to happen. Where you start to change. And you get going again. Yes. As we talked about this last time that we were here. I was talking about the uh, ten virgins and the virgins. The five that didn't have the oil. The Lord spoke to me when I asked him. I said, why didn't they have the oil? He said, because they're lukewarm. They have no relationship with me. There are too many people out there, too many Christians that are walking around that do not have a true relationship with God. They do not have a true relationship with God. They know of God. For many years in church, I went to church, I think I was born in church. I've been around church all my life. Praise the Lord, I'm not complaining. But there was time I didn't go to church. I knew of God. I'd give my life to Christ. But I wasn't for Christ. Even though I loved Christ. I wanted to do everything for, for God. I love God. But I didn't really do it. See, I was, I was lukewarm. I didn't have a relationship with God. And that's what we need is a true relationship with God. To walk and talk and to be with him. I remember the scripture. It says, pray without ceasing. And I says, oh my goodness, how do you pray without ceasing? I got to work. I got to sleep. How do you pray while you sleep? There's something wrong here. It didn't make sense. It did not compute. So one day I was praying about that. I said, Father, how am I going to pray without ceasing? I want to pray without ceasing, but I don't know how. And he said one thing. When you have such a connection to me, that it doesn't matter what you're doing. I can speak to you at any second. Or you're constantly speaking to me. And at that point I said, wow, this is amazing. I was just, it was all, I said, that's simple as it can be. Just have an open communication 120, you know, 24 hours a day with the Lord. All the time, communication. Communication, communication. See, sometimes we block ourselves off. Sometimes the Lord tried to speak to you, and you said, what? Uh, uh, and you don't pay any attention. Boy, I, I've been in trouble. The Lord will tell me something's going to happen, and I'm thinking, no, you know, I wasn't even paying attention to him. And all of a sudden, something happens, and I says, dang, God, I missed it again. He was trying to protect me from this happening, and I didn't listen to him, and I didn't ask him, so it happened. It wasn't his fault, it was my fault because I wasn't listening. Think about that. How many times have you had something happen that God's probably trying to teach you but you aren't even listening to him? I learned a long time ago. I don't care, the Lord tells me to do this, tells me to do that, but the problem comes down to one thing. It comes down to one thing. You have to ask him what does he want or how to do it. Because many times he'll tell you to do something, you go to do it, but it's not what he wanted. It's what you wanted. It's what you think. It's how you want. That's why I said way back when I'd learn I can't do much. So I just said, Lord, I'm sick and tired of Christians losing the victory. I says, and what would you do? What do you want to have done? Not my will, but your will. See, when you start to flip that into his category and you start to listen to him, he can perfect you and put you in places you're going. People have done things. It's awesome. We had a, a person one time come up in a church, and he said, man, I've been to the pastor, and I told him that we need to be doing this, and they're gonna, not going to do this. He says, I'm going to go leave. And he left. 
I said, wow. He was more concerned about what he wanted to have done than what God wanted to have done. He didn't ask if God was supposed to tell him to leave. He just wanted to leave because they weren't going to do what he wanted to do. You get in that self-centeredness, I guarantee you, you might hear from God, but you're going to be off. That's the season of learning how to be and listen and to humble yourself before the Lord to do what the Lord wants you to do. Just because he tells you to do something, you better be finding out exactly what does he mean. As I said the other day, there was something that happened here. And when I walk up on something like that, I stand there and I listen to what the Lord wants to have happen. I know what I want to do, but I have to find out what does the Lord want to have done. And when that happens, that's what goes from there. And I'm saying, wow, that's what it's about. The reason I'm saying there's a revival coming, because the prophets have been saying that even Kent, or, uh, Kent Christmas talked about glory at the end of, the, of this year, going into next year, and through next year. Glory, glory, glory. If things happen the wrong way, there won't be glory. It'll be chaos. But God comes in and takes chaos and turns it into glory. He also was saying, it's it just, I mean, I've heard other prophets say, the first part of next year is going to be glorious, fantastic. God's going to move. Then also towards the end of the year. I've also had a prophecy I've talked about, turning point. Turning point says I'm coming in with a, a three-point cord. One is rebuild, restore, and, and renew. So in other words, you're starting to see, he says, I'm trying to make your future. He's changing things around. God has decided to come in for some reason. I don't know if he said we can't do it or he said time's getting short and I got to step up my game. I don't know what he's doing or saying. He is walking in and he's going to be doing some things. And that's why I said Roth had sent a paper. And I've mentioned about it before about this lady that was a prophet. And the prophet was seen like this big city. It's like Central Park in New York City. And all of a sudden the people were in the park. And all of a sudden they all got slain in the spirit. Healed, set free, delivered, given their life to Christ. And not one man was there. Not one human did it. God did it. When God walks in and does some things, there's a process. I believe time's coming close. You hear a lot about it. I'm not worried about the closeness. I'm worried about if the people are ready for the, when the closeness comes. When it happens. If you worry about the people, instead of worrying about the time, you'll be in a much better condition. So what happens is I'm believing that the Lord is preparing his bride to make him without spot or without wrinkle. Without spot or wrinkle. I believe that's what this anointing, that's what the glory is going to come. He's going to start to turn the people around. He's going to bring the people back whose hearts have not turned against him. If the hearts turned against him, as I talked the last time I was there, because of the, the, the son, prodigal son that had, had left, and the Lord had said the reason he only came back to his father after he spent all of this stuff and said, oh, if I was only at my father's house, he would just as a hand, hired hand, he didn't believe he wanted to go back and be a part of the family because he couldn't. He'd already squandered everything he did, everything that God had given him, everything that the father had given him. When he came back, he only came back because his heart was not turned against his father. Many people who are Christians, their hearts have turned and gotten hard against God those will be hard to come back if they come back at all. Scripture even talks about that. But the reality is God still is looking to bring them back if there's any possible way. He says, I never leave you. I will never forsake you. He says, I want none to, to be lost. I want all to be saved. And that's what he's doing right now. When, when that rapture comes, immediately what's going to happen is God's going to have every person ready that he can get ready to bring them in. He wants them to come home with him. He does not want to leave them. This is a season that's coming up. A season of revival, of changing people's hearts back to the Lord. Even if they're cold, they'll be turned back if they have not turned their heart from God. He, the anointing will come in in such a way it'll start to change people's lives. I'm thinking, wow, praise it. This is just it's blowing me away. And then, as we also said with Sid Roth, that uh, Sandra Kennedy, Sandra Kennedy is a um, is one of the members of World Ministry Fellowship, the ones that we're ordained through. World Ministry Fellowship. 
She was down there and it would never allow a woman to be in a meeting from the old school. And it turned out where she came and she, they, put her, they put her in as a, as a speaker in one of our annual meetings. She wasn't the head speaker. She was just a speaker, kind of off the side here, one of those meetings. And people were so impressed with her, the next year they made her the main person. She was a headliner of all the meetings. I mean, to go from not allowing any woman to be in the headliner the next year, there was something going on there because the power of God was moving through her. She's had over 40 years of ministry in, in her ministry down in Georgia. And all of a sudden she said that she told Sid Roth that what's happening is manna is showing up. She has a, a kind of a, an ark that she puts in this area, and she has a healing room, and manna is showing up. It's developing. It's just showing up. And she said there's a rod of Aaron and it. It's growing with, you know, it's, it's growing. It's a dead branch sitting there. But now there's leaves coming on it. And she said what happens is she took 50, enough to feed 50 people of the bread of the manna, and she fed 300 and had the same amount left over when she got through. And then when she took the rod and goes like this, the anointing is so strong, people just, amazing what happens. It's the beginning of signs and wonders, and I'm telling you right now, do not chase the signs and the wonders. Do not go after the signs and the wonders, because the signs and the wonders are for those who are not saved. If you want signs and wonders, you're not looking at the right thing. we got a God that brings us signs and wonders. We can go to the God that loves us and shows us the signs and the wonders. But so many people, we get in the flesh, and we would go see the signs and the wonders. Be very careful that the enemy will use that to come against you and stop you. We need to go to God. So the signs and wonders will walk through you. You don't have to go to some place to see it. It should be happening here. I'm believing that this is going to happen. The revival is starting. It's going to start happening here. Signs and wonders shall show up. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's, it's time. It's ready. If you're desiring and want it, it shall come to pass. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Also, last Tuesday, <clears throat> well, actually a week ago Tuesday when I was sitting preparing for last week, which Sharon taught, so I didn't have to teach because I forgot she was teaching. But I was preparing, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, I just felt, man, I need to do it. And I got a Bible on my phone. I was sitting right beside the bed. I pick it up. It's easy to read because there's a light on it. that I have to get a light out and look at it and all that stuff. And I just felt I was supposed to be in Hebrews because I've been in Hebrews and I've read through Hebrews several times. It's just like the Lord keeps me in Hebrews. So I'm in Hebrews. I read chapter 4, 5, and 6. I was going to 7. And all of a sudden I hit 10 instead of 7. And I said, I wanted seven, but I felt in my spirit I needed to read ten. And I says, well, Lord, I'll read ten. So if you want to read that, dear. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. For the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, Look, I have come to do your will, O God, as, as is written about me in the scriptures. First, Christ said, 
You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they are required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I took and I was going through there on three and this one, it's a little different version, but it says, the yearly sacrifice reminded them of their sin year after year. And when I was reading that this morning, the Lord comes in and starts to say, how many people here today would say, man, I keep thinking about how bad I did things, how I, I messed up here, I've caused that problem. This happened, that happened. I'm always doing the same thing. All that is, it's a reminder of your sin. It's a reminder of your sin. The devil wants to remind you of your sin. People around you want to remind you of your sin. You have areas that you've been in and, and you go through that and you'll start to remind you of your sin. Remind you of your sin. This is what the Lord says. Today, people end up getting reminded of their sin constantly. And I said, wow, I was thinking about that. But, that was the old system. There's a new system that has been taken and put in place of that. That you don't have to be reminded of your sin. You do not have to be reminded of your sin. And see that this is one of the areas that the Lord is really dealing with in this season. In this season, there is a newness, a freshness. Not even actually new, it's old. But it's fresh. It's a fresh reminder, a fresh understanding. Things that are starting to come in. Things that are starting to be done. Because, see, this is why Christ came to the world. Why? He came to, to destroy the works of the devil. What is the works of the devil? To get you to sin. He destroyed the works of the devil. And the works of the devil is to get you to sin. How does he get you to sin? Condemnation. Accusing you. People around there are going to come after you and try to change you. What happened was the new covenant was designed by Jesus. He came in, he gave us a new. He said the old system of law was of the shadow of things to come. But Christ came and brought a new covenant, a new way to walk, a new way to understand things that are happening. And this is what the Lord keeps hitting me every time I go back to, to Hebrews. He says, there's a new covenant, a new covenant, a new covenant. He keeps hitting me, the new covenant. And I'm thinking, okay, this is awesome, new covenant. I understand the new covenant. But revival comes when you understand the new covenant. Revival comes when you understand the new covenant. I said, wow. Revival comes when you understand the new covenant. In John 19, 28, you want to read that there? Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and released his spirit. There you go. What was finished? See, it said that it was finished. What actually was finished? What he had to do to bring forth the new covenant. He had did his part in bringing forth that new covenant. 
See, the works of the devil had been defeated. The works of the devil is to kill, steal, and destroy. How does he kill, steal, and destroy? He provokes you or brings you into a point of sin. He brings you into the point of sin. You can take and, and immediately, uh, like I said, used to say, I used to be the worst sinner of you all because my mind was the worst thing. I wanted to kill a few people. I wanted to go out and beat some people up. I hated some people. Never came out of my muck, praise the Lord. But it was in my mind. I said, God, how can you use such a no good person like me because of all the thoughts in my mind? But the Lord said, your heart's locked on the Lord. It's not about your thoughts and your mind. Unless you start to, as the word says, as soon as you have a thought in your mind and you start to ponder on it. See, the enemy throws stuff in your mind and it starts to ponder on it. And when you start to ponder on it, it then becomes sin. And when it becomes sin, and then it becomes death. Sin separates you from God. And that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to separate you from God every single time. He wants to take the glory that God has given you. He wants to give you the awesome favor that God has given you and steal your favor, steal your health, steal what's going on. He gets you to sin, and that's how he gets you to do it. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, to destroy sin. Sin is the works of the devil. The New Covenant says we don't have to walk in sin. We don't have to think about sin. We don't have to be in sin. He has made a way out. He has given us a covenant, a blood covenant that will cover our sins. He takes care of the sins. They're washed away. Jesus, I mean, God sits here, and he looks at you through the blood as being cleansed and perfect. He says, I give you a covenant. No longer will I remember your sins. If you're remembering your sins, why? The devil's trying to destroy you again. He's trying to get you back into the same thing. If he can get you to sin, if he can say, oh, I'll never, I'm not going to do anything, I'm not going to be good, God can't bless me, God doesn't love me, you don't know the word of God because God says he, he does love you. He'll never stop loving you. You need to know the word even more. And when you do, all of a sudden, you start to see that covenant, and that covenant starts to become real to you, and it starts to change your life. You start to walk in a new way. You start to bring forth holiness. That's what God is, to bring you holy before him. When you talk and you walk in that covenant, the new covenant, the blood covenant, you are no longer a sinner saved by grace. I used to say that all the time because in the religious world, that's what I was trained. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Oh boy, I'm going to sin. You have to sin because you're a sinner. But God's there to take care of that sin once you sin. That's a lie from the pits of hell. God said, I took away your sin. God says, I will never remind you of your sin. Hallelujah. Jesus has made a way so you don't have to sin. Will we sin? Yes. I'm not going to lie to you. It says we all fall short of the glory of God. We all have a flesh. We all are pulled away. We're all being war by our flesh. Our flesh wears against our spirit. It pulls us away. It depends. Are you going to walk in the, in the spirit or are you going to walk in the flesh? You walk in the flesh, I guarantee you, you're walking in the old covenant. When you walk in the, in the spirit, you're walking in the new covenant. Because the old covenant was only just something to cover your sin, to kind of keep you going. But it never took away your sin. The new covenant took away your sin. You don't have to do that. But see, the body has been taught, oh, yes, you're a sinner side by grace. You're never going to quit sinning. You, you just have to sin because you're a sinner. No, God changed our personality. He took the sinful nature and washed it away. We no longer have to walk in that. It's how what we want to do. It's what we desire to do. 
If we don't get that understanding that we do not have to walk in sin, if we don't have that understanding what the, the new covenant had really given us, that we can walk in the righteousness of Christ, our righteousness is such filthy rags. Don't trust on what you can do, but trust on what God to do. The more we relationship we have with Father, the more understanding, the more we trust him and work that way. That's what's going to happen. This is what the Lord is saying. Revival is coming because once we start to understand and walk in that new covenant in a way that we're supposed to do, we will do that. Genesis 3, 4, if you would, dear. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. <laughs> and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Yep. Praise the Lord. See, Eve deception allowed lustful desires to bring, I should say, Eve being deceived, allowed lustful desires to hire, uh, to uh, bring destruction. Eve's being deceived. And it said right there, what happened? It says, you shall not surely die. But what did God say? If you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. She was deceived. It opened her eyes so that she said, you shall be gods, knowing good and evil. There was a lustful desire to change. I'm going to be better off if I eat this. I'm going to be better off if I do that. But see, they didn't listen to God. Because of that, and there's a lot of things I can preach on during that. People preach this, preach that. I'm just putting out a principle right here. Because of the deception, she was deceived. Through that de deception, she had a lustful desire that was fulfilled. The devil is the one that knew the only way he would get a legal right over anything was to deceive one of them, male or female. That time they were called Adam. She was not called Eve at that, Eve at that time. They were Adam. They were one in the image of God. And through that process, immediately what happened was she ate and they died spiritually. They knew, the devil knew, that if he could take and get the Spirit of God to go back to heaven where he belongs in his eyes then immediately he could do what he wanted to do because he, he had authority he had authority at that point in the kingdom the king and the prince all the way through the Old Testament the Old Covenant every time you go through you and you start to throw in the Old Covenant you are doing one thing you are looking at a covenant which is a contract between God and you because the men at that time did not want to actually relate to God as a king, did not want to spend time with him, but wanted a king on this earth. So he set up the king, the priest, and the lords, or king, the priest, and the prophets. The king, the priest, and the prophets were the ones that really heard from God. If you had a good king, guess what? A godly king, you, you would have blessed lands. You were blessed people. If you didn't, you were cursed. If you didn't do right things, God would send the enemy against you and destroy you. Happened time and time again. People were serving God. They were all blessed. When you start to look at all the way through the Old Testament, there's only one principle that you have to realize. Satan was the prince of the power of the air, which was given, which he received. It wasn't given to him. He received it by deception, by deceiving Adam to eat of the, the fruit. And at that point, 
the authority of the king left. When the king's gone, the prince is in charge. So the prince is here. And what happens is God then had to say, I'm still going to protect you, but there's only one way I can do I'm going to give you a law. And that law, if you follow the law, I will protect you. I will bless you. And you will be all right at the end. If you don't, sorry. It's up to you. It's all physical. All physical. All the prophets, all the laws were pertaining until the time Jesus came. It was all predicting Jesus. It was all through that. What was finished when Jesus says, it is finished? He completed his part of the transference of the old covenant to the new covenant. This is what I heard directly from the Lord. This is a hard thing to take. I'm going to tell you, it's a hard thing to take, but it's something that we have to realize. Religion is a blend of old covenant and the new covenant this causes many not to understand the new covenant, thus not be living in freedom. I want you to, to hear that. This is directly from the Lord. He says, this is what I want you to deal with this coming up this next year especially. He says, religion is blended, the blend of the old covenant with the new covenant this causes many to not understand the new covenant and this thus not living in freedom. I already talked about why won't you live in freedom because you're always worried about your sin. Oh, I'm no good. I can't do this. I can't do that. Why? You're still remembering your sin. But if you understand under the new covenant, yes, you're going to sin. Because the Bible says that. But the more you get close to the Lord, the less you sin. The less you desire to sin. But the fact is, if you sin, all you have to do is go to our high priest today and say, Lord, forgive me. And the grace and the mercy falls upon us. It is gone. God not didn't even see you sinful anymore. He says, I will not remember any of your sins. How can we remember a sin? That's Old Testament. Old Testament says, without the right blood of Jesus, you're going to remember your sin all the time. You can't be free if you got sin and you're thinking about you're doing the sin, that God can't forgive you for what you just asked. That's, that's Old Testament. It's the same thing as God, you know, that we used to sing a song. I love the song. I love the song. So let God arise and our enemies be scattered. It's Old Covenant. And when God arises, we're done for. Because he gave us the authority to make it happen. We don't have to follow a law. We have to follow the love of God. We have to have the word of God. We have to change the situation. We need to get out of saying, I'm no good. Yes, you are. God created you. Why are you saying God created junk? And the old covenant could possibly be that way. So we're sitting here saying, Lord, that's what he told me. He says, religion is a blend of the old with the new. He says, I want you to start to work and bring the new into complete light so that we can all walk in freedom like we've never walked before. One of the things that the Lord had brought up, he, it just hit me, been a while back here. It says that uh, when... Yeah, I kind of lost my thought there real quick. Who was it that prayed and it took so long to get Daniel to get down from heaven? They had fight in the heavenlies. It was Daniel. And then my brain just kind of went out. Sorry about that. I didn't have that in my notes, but it's just something the Lord wants me to say. He said when it came down, what happened? The angels were having troubles getting through the second heaven because they were fighting what he was doing. What did it have to happen? God had to send more angels down to take and get through so that message could come to Daniel. I hear people all the time, oh, it's going to take a while. There's a heavenly fight going on. There's a heavenly fight going on. New covenant. You have authority over those spirits that stop that from coming your way. 
Don't say it's going to take a long time. If you're walking in the Spirit of God, you know what the Word is. The minute you ask, God's heard you. If you're lined up with Him and walking in freedom, and it's not going to be those demons are going to be holding it because you're going to bind those things up and it's going to right down to you. But if we're walking in a mixture of old and new, well, yeah, sometimes God says yes, yeah, sometimes God says no. Yeah, sometimes there's a fight going on and God's not going to give you. See, you're just flipping it back and forth. That's when you blend the old with the new. And I sit here and the Lord says, work to change it around so people walk in the new. Not in a blended of the old and the new. Because there's a newness. He says, I didn't come to take it away. Does it mean you don't talk about the Old Testament? No. Does it mean that you don't see concepts in the Old Testament? No. It's be careful when you do that. It might have been fulfilled, and you need to go to the new to understand what God is doing today. Because the old might be holding you back. See, the difference is, and, and this is one of the things that came up, that we have... People that have said, oh, yeah, you've got to go to the courtroom. Take people to the courtroom. Plead your case. Plead your case. I said, my God, what are you doing? I don't understand this. What are these people talking about? I, I, I just, it doesn't make sense to me, Lord. Why do we have to go to the courtroom and plead a case? I know you're the judge. I know you have a courtroom. I know that you can change people's lives. And people said, oh, it's so fantastic. We went up there and this happened and that happened. And this went that way and this went that way. From the New Testament. See, Old Testament, the devil's here. Then you have to pray to God and get everything taken care of. See, that there's that hump that you have to go over. You have to go around the devil. And you have to have God do everything for you. Let God arise and your enemies be scattered. Guess what happens in the New Testament? He said, because of the blood of Jesus, we now can go through the veil and enter into his throne room. Boldly into his throne room. And I kept thinking when I heard this teaching coming out, I said, Father, why would I want to take somebody to the courtroom when I can sit beside the judge. Your word. Is what we use. When you start to look at the word in the new covenant. What does it mean? What is it going to do? Yes, there are things that God's going to intervene and make happen. But you have the authority and power to speak it out. And to bring it to pass. See, that's, that's where it's at. That's the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And I says, Father, I don't understand. Why, why would this man hear this from you? Because he said, the Lord told me to do this. He says, because there, he was a he, he, prophets. Prophets are awesome. I love prophets. But prophets study not the New Covenant, the Old Covenant. The tendency to walk in the understanding of the Old Covenant is not when the prophets flip from that into the understanding the new covenant, they can still be a prophet. But when they start to understand the new covenant, the new way that God wants to do, the old has passed away, the new has come in. But see, we have, in religion, we have a tendency to go back to the old, to talk more about the old and, more, and then we do the new. Because it's easier to understand if you are highly intelligent, you can understand the old because the old has to do with logics. The new blows your mind away. It's so simple. It's hard to understand. It is simple. Then the word says something about the God uses a simple to confuse the, the wise. It's simple. But if you're in the old, it, it's like, wow. But you're still walking under that principle. That you have to go to God and let God do these things. Whereas God says here, in the New Testament, it's different. And what all happened? When we're talking about the kingdom of God, of course. Matthew 11.1. 1. I'm not going to read it. 
We don't have it up there unless you want to flip it up. Because I didn't tell Sarah on that one. She's good at doing that. King James. You want to read that, dear? Uh, uh, okay, I'll just tell you. Go ahead and read it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he debart, departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John... 17, had, not 11, 17. Matthew, sorry about that. <laughs> Matthew 17. Did I say um, 11? I probably did. Yeah, you did. So for, Sorry about that. 17. 17. One, yeah. Start with one and go from there. There we there go. There we go. Matthew 17, 1. And after six days, Jesus take Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bring them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face shone, shined as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, if it is good for us to be here, if thou wilt, let us make here these tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Stop. I didn't know really what went on until I heard Miles Monroe say one time, he was praying, and the Lord just brought him back, and he says, Why did this happen? And Miles didn't really know, and he says, what happened was there was a transference at that point from the teaching of the Old Covenant, the law and the prophet. Moses was the law. Elijah was, was the prophet. And when they were there, immediately what happened, they dropped off. They disappeared. And then God said, this is my son. Hear what he has to say. Hear ye him. Listen to him. Hear what he says. And in Matthew 11, we're not going to it. Matthew 11, 3, it says, The law and the prophet was preached until John. After John, the kingdom. It doesn't say that. I'm just paraphrasing. It says the kingdom was teach, taught. The kingdom is a new covenant. The kingdom is your authority, your power. Old Testament was if I do this law, God's going to protect me. The new law is I can walk in the spirit. I can have righteousness. I can be righteous through Jesus Christ. I don't have to worry about my sins. If I sin, yes, if I'm trying to do my best I can and I sin and I ask Christ, he'll forgive me. And as soon as he forgives me, then we'll go on down the road and we'll have a great time. Victory, victory is coming when you start to understand clearly exactly the difference between the old and the new. Like I said, it's not that we're just going to cut the old off because God says he's, he's fulfilling. You can look at the old. You can look at the new. But relay when you do that how it affects you from the new because there's so many times when you affect from the new. It's just like that with Daniel. There's a difference before God had to do it. God had to stand up and the enemy would be scattered. What happens? He's given you the authority to take over that. If you go back to it, and we talked about this up in Ventura. I've said it before. It's in Revelations 12, I believe. Want that, Sarah? Revelations 12. That's one thing I was not going to look up. But it uh, praises the Lord. You got that one? Yeah, I know. He was, he was 12. It was uh, 9, I think. Yeah. Okay, 10. Actually, start with 9 and 10. Got it there, dear? And 
the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. See, this is one thing I talked about before. You have to realize prior to this, in the Old Covenant, the devil was in heaven accusing us of God, before God. When Jesus came, and it, it says something here, and you won't hear much about this. I've never heard too much about it. But Pastor Stephanie, I was talking to her about this scripture. been a while back. And she picked up the exact same thing that I picked up. She says, I seen that. I didn't realize this before. But it says, when I heard the loud voice shouting across the heaven, it has come at last. And mine reads a little bit different than yours. Anyway, it's up there. Salvation and power and the kingdom of God. Has salvation come? Is salvation here today? Yes or no? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Salvation is here. Is the kingdom of God here yeah. today? Yes. Okay, if salvation come, if the kingdom of God has come, and the authority, it says power. What does Acts 1.8 says? When you receive the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power. Power. Okay, why? He says, and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of the brethren and sisters have been thrown down to earth. The one who accused them before our God day and night. Now, heaven has been cleared because it says, you know, it's, they rejoice in, in heaven because he's been cast down. Where is he? He's here coming against you. Why is he here coming against you? In the Old Testament, he was up there going to God. Now he's down here coming against you. Why? New covenant. You are a king. You have taken the authority that he had in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. You can go through the Old Covenant, fine. But if you get into the New Covenant and see the authority, see the power, see what you have, see what's going on. The Lord said, I will bring people in. I will do things like you've ever done before. Somebody said a while back here, there was a guy in prison. And he said, if the people who were saved knew the power they have in this word of God, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Woo! What's God going to do? Set the captives free. Who's going to do it for God? God, no. Us. We don't pray to God and say, God, come down here and save this person. No, you need to go and you need to bind those spirits that hinder in him. Take the authority over it. Release the word of God of it. Proclaim and decree the king upon them. And guess what happens? You say, oh, that can't happen. Yes, I turn around and I said, whoa. If you look at the book that was given to us here a while back or we had for sale when Daniel was here. It was um, Kenneth Hagin's book. And he said in there that in 1 Corinthians, he started to read. He says he went to his church and he sat there. It was 1 Corinthians 1. He had some of the scriptures. I forget. And he went to also in, in the third ver uh, chapter. And he read some scriptures out of there about power and authority and wisdom and knowledge. He said he took time and he sat in the presence of the Lord and just prayed that over him, prayed that over him, prayed that over him, prayed that over him. He's not asking God. He's not asking for anything. He's not doing He says, Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me the wisdom, give me the knowledge, give me the strength, give me the understanding, get me going, take this going on. And as he's through here, he said, when he came out of that whole period of, of doing this, he walked in his house and he said, told his wife, I don't know why the elders didn't kick me out of church because I didn't, didn't even know what I was talking about. God showed me so much, and he set him free. Why did you think he had one of the largest college for Christian learning? Why do you think when we put the, the video up on top here, when he was standing and all he'd do is start laughing and the power of God hit him, that one guy, if you remember the video he took off, he jumped up on the stage over the platform, went over and right into, the <laughs> into where they did the baptismal. 
Why do you think that's happening? Because he took time to be with God. He knew who he was in God. He knew what was going. Jesus did one thing. Miles said thing. The disciples only asked, according to our scriptures, Jesus, one thing. What was that one thing? How do we need to pray? He said, because when you start to see, because he has a lot of information, God gave him a lot of wisdom about the kingdom, and he said, when he's, what happened was the thing that's happening today, Jesus, they seen Jesus go in the morning and sit before the Lord and pray. And when he came out, what did he do? Everything that needed to be done. It wasn't waiting. He was instant in season and out. When he went and he prayed, he got his heart right. He came out and he did the ministry. He did the work. If you take time and you get before the Lord and you get to know that's exactly what Kenneth did, he came out. He said he only took and he'd been praying for his relatives for 20 years and nothing happened. He proclaimed that and decreed that over his uh, relationship, his cousins, his family. And he says within two months, he called him and he says, you are not going to believe what kind of revelation I have. That's the new kingdom. That's the new covenant. That's our authority. That's our power. That's what we can do. That's what we ask God. What do you want? How are we going to change? What are we going to change around us? That's what it's about. That's what God wants to bring in. Also on Thursday night, we had our Zoom. And I was, I was sitting there and I was struggling Sometimes it's not easy to get on Thursday night. It'd be nicer to do something else on Thursday night. But I've set it up and made a commitment to get on Zoom. Sometimes we've got a few. Sometimes we've got more. Praise God for those who get on because I figured, Father, there's the one that need it. And the fact is they got in and we start going. And it was tougher than nails trying to pull on Zoom that, that Thursday night. They were just trying to pray in the Holy Ghost. And, and finally I says, you know, I start thinking about the book about the prayers that we need to pray, and I said, I'm going to start praying some prayers. I give up on just praying in the Holy Ghost, trying to hear what the Lord was saying. So I start praying some prayers. They weren't the prayers that were in the book that I read that I knew to pray about. It's just what the Lord was showing me. All of a sudden, the anointing hit that place. I went back and I played the, the song about sitting beside Jesus, sitting in heavenly places, and the anointing popped even more. And I said, I got in the heavenly glory right then. The glory hit me so strong. I'm sitting there, and the word came. And the one word that came out of that, what I was saying, that I remember the most of, fresh. There's a new, not a new, because I kept saying, I should say new, fresh. And God says, no, it's not new. It's just fresh. I am taking what you have, and I'm going to blow a wind of freshness of the Holy Spirit across you. I'm going to give you something. If you start to look at what God wants, ask him what he wants, ask him what's happening, there's going to be a freshness going to blow over you. And I just sense in the Spirit immediately, there are so much things that we want to get done here. So many people that have so many different things they want to do. And the Lord is going to put that fresh anointing on them. And as that fresh anointing comes over, they're going to get stirred up some of the some of the visions that you've had, some of the desires that you've had, some of the things you want to see done are going to start to come and be built back up. The fire is going to start to bring that back into your heart. There's a desire and a burning to receive those things. When you get that, let us know. We'll do what we can to help you bring that to pass. If we've got the people, we'll do it. If we don't, we'll keep praying and we'll just keep decreeing that the people will be here so we can do those things that need to do. I was reading a book the other day and I said, wow, out of this one ministry, this one guy got a revelation and he went down to a parking lot in the middle of downtown. He had a few other people that came along with him. It was uh, Charles and, and uh, the other hunter. I can't remember her name right now. But anyway, who? Francis Hunter. There we go. And they said they went down and they just laid hands on and prayed for people and they brought money and they brought food and they brought clothing and they did whatever it did and people were starting to come around and people were starting to get healed and received the fullness of the glory of God what would happen in Des Moines if that started to happen people start getting healed things started happening I mean it's happened before but 
than if we have a system set up where they can be funneled into so we can train them and bring them up to who they need to be and what they need to be and be able to give them the training that they need, start to see that they're a king in a kingdom. They have the, the authority and the power that the devil comes against them. They don't have to walk in their sin anymore. They can turn and put it off the side. They can walk more in the spirit than they do in the flesh because the flesh is fear. The flesh is from the old but the spirit is the new. That's where we're at. God says, bring up the new covenant. Divide it from the old and bring it into the new. Yes, the old was there. It was for that time season. But today, the new is for today. Today, we need to walk in the new covenant, understand the new covenant, and receive from God what he wants us to have and to do. So we give God glory. I praise. And if I've offended anybody, please talk to me later because I know this subject can cause problems within people i know we, because we're so used to doing so much for so long i'm just listening to the holy ghost i said what do you want to do what do you want to say and when he said that revival's coming he says do you be able to get through and understand the new covenant and walk in the new covenant that's what i gave you the authority and power you have authority and power over those spirits you have authority and power over those spirits coming against other people bind those spirits up take authority over them. decree and declare the word of god over people pick a scripture up and pray it you know decree it do what you got to do some people say it's pray some people say it's decree as a king whatever you decree it shall happen as you pray you ask god to do it and he, he's probably going to do it if you're lining up with his word but I'm just saying, get into the new covenant. Use the authority. Use the power. Use the kingdom. Use what you've got. Use what God gave us to be able to break the works of the devil. The works of the devil is sin. It's got to go in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you glory, honor, and praise. We thank you for this time. And we know that anything was trying to, everything was trying to stop us to get here because it did not want us to put this out because it knows as we get into that situation and we start to walk in that new covenant with the authority and power and believing without doubt and knowing that you will bring these things to pass, it shall happen, saith the Lord. I give you glory, Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, protect and keep everybody safe. Keep everybody going in the name of Jesus. Amen.